Have you ever promised yourself, I'll never do that again, and then you end up doing it again? It's a discouraging cycle many of us can fall into when it, become, when it comes to sin. But the great news is the atonement is available throughout the entire process. Brad Wilcox, author of The Continuous Atonement, joins us now with his insight on how the atonement works for all of us. Good morning, Brad. Good morning. I love this topic because it's the greatest gift of all, is it not? Yes. I, where would we be without it? You know, just considering the, pro, the, the people who have been speaking on this program, where would we be without it? Exactly. In your book, you say that Christ suffered for our sins, not just multiple sins, but the same sin multiple times. He's so merciful. Yes, and that's good news, especially for people who get caught in downward cycles of compulsive behavior, because the natural tendency for all of us is to quit. Oh, I can't do this. I can't do this. And we want to quit. And instead, we need to remember that, yes, it's a perfecting process and that the atonement is there throughout the entire process and not just, it's not just a one-shot deal. Exactly. Process, I think, is the key word. With the atonement, talk about the difference between saving and redeeming. Is there a difference? Well, for many years, I believed they were just synonyms. I thought that saving and redeeming were the same thing. But the more I've looked into it and, and the more I understand it, they really are different roles. Think about Easter eggs. Uh, we, we use the Easter egg as a symbol of new life that is offered to us through the atonement, but then what do we do? We color the eggs, we transform them, we change them, and that's the redeeming role of Jesus Christ. If the whole goal is just to get back to God, then why did we leave? The goal is to get back and be better than we were before we left, and that's also a blessing that is given to us by Jesus Christ. I think all of us have heard people say, I'm not worthy enough to pray, I'm not worthy enough to go to church. What do you say to those people? Well, I work with young people who say that all the time. I even had a young man say to me, I'm not worthy to repent. Now figure that one out. I think we, so guilty, Yes, right? yeah. and we all feel discouraged, but that's when we have to remember that the grace of Jesus Christ is not a light at the end of the tunnel waiting for us to make our way through the tunnel so that we can then get there. Rather, it's the enabling power that surrounds us here and now and moves us through that tunnel. Elder Bruce C. Hafen, who uh, was just made an emeritus member of the First Quorum of Seventy, said that gr grace is not a gift that comes after all we can do. It's not limited to that, that we actually can feel Christ's grace before, during, and after the time when we expend our own efforts. No, that's a great point, because I don't think many people would see it that way. So what does Christ require of us? Yeah, and you're right. There are requirements. Uh, it's not just a, hey, I've been saved, so I don't have to do anything. But the requirements are not to earn heaven, rather to learn heaven. I always think of Christ's relationship to us as kind of a mom who's paying for piano lessons for her child. Um, because mom pays the piano teacher and pays the piano teacher in full, then mom can turn and ask something of the child. Now, what is it, Kathy? Practice. Yeah, you practice, know. Practice, practice, practice. Now, does the child's practice pay mom back for paying the piano teacher? No. Yeah. Does the child's practice pay the piano teacher? No. The child's practice is how he can take advantage of this wonderful gift that mom is giving him, this chance to live his life on a higher plane. Elder Dallin H. Oaks has said, um, you know, he says, it's not a matter, you know, when we suffer for our sins, it's not a matter of pay payment or punishment. It's a matter of change. So if we think of that piano analogy, the, the kid has to practice the piano, but it's not because we're punishing him and it's not because he's paying Instead, it's change. That practice is how he can lift, be lifted to a higher level. That's a beautiful way to put, put it. Brad Wilcox, it's a great book on a very important topic. Thanks so much for coming in and sharing it with us today. Thank you. Thank you. We're giving away two copies of The Continuous Atonement on our Facebook page. If you'd like a copy of this book, go to our Facebook page at Mormon Times TV, like us, and leave us a comment about how the atonement has made a difference in your life. We'll randomly select two people to receive this book.
All of us are entitled to receive the tender mercies of the Lord associated with the atonement. Elder David A. Bednar spoke of these tender mercies during a general conference address. Since last October, I have reflected repeatedly upon the phrase, the tender mercies of the Lord. To my mind came this verse from the Book of Mormon. But behold, I, Nephi, will show unto you that the tender mercies of the Lord are over all those whom he hath chosen because of their faith to make them mighty, even unto the power of deliverance. The Lord's tender mercies are the very personal and individualized blessings, strength, protection, assurances, guidance, loving kindnesses, consolation, support, and spiritual gifts which we receive from and because of and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Recall how the Savior instructed his apostles that he would not leave them comfortless. Not only would he send another comforter, even the Holy Ghost, but the Savior said that he would come to them. Let me suggest that one of the ways whereby the Savior comes to each of us is through his abundant and tender mercies. For instance, as you and I face challenges and tests in our lives, the gift of faith and an appropriate sense of personal confidence that reaches beyond our own capacity are two examples of the tender mercies of the Lord. Repentance and forgiveness of sins and peace of conscience are examples of the tender mercies of the Lord. And the persistence and the fortitude that enable us to press forward with cheerfulness through physical limitations and spiritual difficulties are examples of the tender mercies of the Lord. The Lord's tender mercies do not occur randomly or merely by coincidence. Faithfulness and obedience enable us to receive these important gifts, and frequently, the Lord's timing helps us to recognize them. We should not underestimate or overlook the power of the Lord's tender mercies. The simpleness, the sweetness, and the constancy of the tender mercies of the Lord will do much to fortify and protect us. When words cannot provide the solace we need or express the joy we feel, when it is simply futile to attempt to explain that which is unexplainable, when logic and reason cannot yield adequate understanding, and when it seems that perhaps we are so totally alone, Truly, we are blessed by the tender mercies of the Lord and made mighty, even unto the power of deliverance. I testify that the tender mercies of the Lord are available to all of us and that the Redeemer of Israel is eager to bestow such gifts upon us. Truly, the Lord is good to all and His tender mercies are over all His works great counsel from Elder Bednar. To view more Mormon messages, long on to LDS.org. We'll be right back with more on Mormon Times, but first, one of our favorite parts, each week we showcase some of our missionaries serving around the world. If you'd like to share a picture of an elder, sister, or a missionary couple that you know, send it to mormontimes at ksl.com. Because I have been sheltered by thy voice. 